My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. I have degrees in archaeology and ancient history from Queen's University, Belfast. My subject is the Roman economy, including trade beyond the imperial frontiers. I have published several books on this subject. I am a member of the Council of the Classical Association of Northern Ireland. At the end of October, the BBC News reported the discovery of an intact ancient shipwreck on the seabed of the Black Sea. The question is, why were ancient Greek and Roman ships in the Black Sea? What were they doing? Where were they headed? Going to or coming back from? There is a concentrated salt water strata far below the surface of the Black Sea. Light cannot penetrate these deep waters, and low oxygen levels prevent the growth of microorganisms that can degrade organic materials. Consequently, ancient and medieval ships that have sunk to these depths have not decomposed, but become submerged in silt on a lifeless seabed. Recently discovered wrecks have the remains of rudders, masts, rigging and coils of rope. Decorative carvings are preserved, and in some instances chisel and tool marks are still visible on individual hull planks. Archaeologists and explorers are currently mapping the remains of these vessels, and the Black Sea therefore offers a unique opportunity to understand the maritime transactions that connected and sustained the ancient world. To the northeast of the Mediterranean, through a narrow channel, lies the Black Sea. The Black Sea was important in the ancient economy because it connected the Greek Mediterranean to the Eurasian steppe. It is over 700 miles across at its widest point and extends more than 160 miles from north to south. It is about one-fifth the size of the Roman Mediterranean but most of the surrounding territories were relatively wild and underdeveloped due to their more northerly latitude. The upper coast extended north to the Eurasian steppe, and the western shores faced the mountainous, forest-covered core of central Europe. The Eurasian steppe was a vast belt of arid grassland extending from Manchuria on the eastern edge of China into Mongolia and across Central Asia to the Black Sea. Most of the steppe was a landscape of thin, wiry grassland in an ecological zone subject to extreme seasonal climates. The people who occupied these territories were mounted nomads, tending large herds of grazing animals that they drove hundreds of miles between seasonal pastures. The steppe population were highly mobile, skilled warriors able to fight as mounted archers. The western steppe narrowed and became more verdant as it approached eastern Europe and some of the lush grasslands in these outlying territories could be seized and farmed by settled communities. The artwork produced for these people is superb. This is a miniature scene on the head of a Scythian comb. During the time of the Greeks, the Pontic steppe, which enclosed the Black Sea, was occupied by a mounted culture known as the Scythians. By the Roman era, the Scythians had been absorbed and replaced by an eastern nation called the Sarmatians. A series of great rivers divided the Pontic Caspian steppe into distinct territories, and these were conduits for the movement of peoples, livestock, and commodities. Mediterranean civilization was shielded from steppe invasions by the forests of Eastern Europe, the Black Sea coastline, and connecting Caucasus mountains. These were barriers to land communication, but the Black Sea provided a thoroughfare for Mediterranean seafarers to visit and trade with the Pontic steppe. This was important because the steppe formed a distinct ecological zone that produced unique and essential products including animal hides and furs. The great rivers that flowed into the Black Sea had abundant stocks of fish, and the fertile seaboard offered excellent lands for grain production. Food production in this region was significant because maritime transport 
was a cheap and convenient way to move goods between distant territories. Figures from the ancient world suggest that maritime transport was more than twenty times cheaper than land haulage. Using winds and tides, a 75-ton cargo vessel could transport the equivalent of 150 wagon loads without the cost and bulk of providing animal fodder on land journeys it could take weeks to accomplish. Greek communities began to colonize the Black Sea coast in the 8th century BC. They established urban centers in grain-producing districts and exported foodstuffs that fostered the growth and development of Aegean city-states such as Athens. Mediterranean ships entered the Black Sea through the Bosporus Passage, a narrow strait 70 miles long and less than two miles wide. In Greek myth, this was the location of the Cenaean rocks, which clashed together and crushed incoming vessels. Here, the Greek hero, Jason, released a dove to trigger the mechanism in order to pass safely through. The early Greeks estimated the size of the Black Sea using information about the length of voyages between its outlying ports. Herodotus had heard that the voyage from the entrance of the Black Sea to Phasis on the extreme east coast was a sailing of nine days and eight nights. By contrast, a voyage to the northern limits of the sea in Crimea could be completed in three days and two nights. This suggests sailing speeds of about three knots, nautical miles per hour, which is half the top speed of ships in the Mediterranean. The Romans knew the approximate size and shape of the Black Sea, which they understood to be a relatively flat southern shore facing an arc-shaped northern coast. Pliny explains that the Black Sea intrudes on a large area of the continent, with a coast formed from a great bend that curves back, as though it were horns, and stretches out on either side to produce the shape of a Scythian bow. Two territories on the Black Sea coast had special significance to classical civilization because of their resources and trade. These were the heavily forested territory of Colchis on the east coast and the agriculturally rich Crimean peninsula to the far north. Colchis was at the frontier of classical civilization and its landscape was defined by myths and legends dating back to the time of Homer. The territory therefore had special significance in the classical mindset as a place for dangerous voyages to the limits of the known world. The main seaport in Colchis was an ancient city called Phasis, founded by Ionian Greeks from Asia Minor in the 6th century BC. The forbidding snow-capped mountains in this edge-of-the-world territory entered Greek myth as a place where the immortal titan Prometheus was chained by the god Zeus as a punishment for giving mankind the secret of fire. Bound to a rock, it was said that a great eagle tore at his innards every day until he was freed from his agony by the intervention of the Greek hero Hercules. Ancient Colchis was also immortalized in the story of Jason and the Argonauts, who sought the golden fleece in these same lands. In ancient times, Colchis was sparsely populated, and although it was rich in natural resources, it had few urban settlements. But the region was positioned along a sailing route that led to another important territory that was also subject to early Greek influence. This was the Crimean Peninsula, known in antiquity as the Chersonensis or Taurus. Crimea was settled by Greek colonists in the 6th century BC, and they became wealthy from farming its rich agricultural land. By the 5th century BC, their cities were under the authority of local Greek tyrants who established dynastic rule over most of the region. At its widest extent, the Crimean Isthmus is almost 200 miles across and stretches nearly 100 miles from north to south. The landmass therefore covers an area larger than the Mediterranean island of Sicily. 
the Greek geographer Strabo was approximately correct when he estimated that the Chersonensis was about the same size as the Greek Peloponnese. The southeast coast of the Crimea was flanked by a narrow range of steep rising mountains, but most of the interior of the isthmus consisted of steppe-like prairie land, ideal for growing grain. The mountains on the eastern seaboard shielded the isthmus from incoming cold weather, and the coast of the Crimea was warmed by black sea currents and mild winds from the south. Consequently, the Crimea enjoyed a temperate climate throughout much of the year, and its coast was well suited to receive foreign shipping, with many small peninsulas, headlands, inlets, bays, and natural harbours. The Crimea was an important producer of grain, and a leading centre for trade goods acquired from the adjoining Eurasian steppe. Strabo explains, Except for the mountainous district extending to Theodosia, the land is everywhere flat, fertile, and extremely favourable for the production of grain. Strabo suggests that the Crimea could produce and ship up to 84,000 tonnes of grain per annum, which is enough to feed over 200,000 people for a year. This grain could support the equivalent of 20 large cities in the eastern Mediterranean. To the northeast lies the Azov Sea. It was heavily diluted by the incoming River Don, and therefore had plentiful stocks of fish. The Chersonensis also had salt works, and since salt was an important preservative in the ancient world, these fish stocks were exported to feed distant cities such as Athens. Strabo explains, In early times the Greeks imported their supplies of grain from the Chersonensis, and they also imported their supplies of salt fish. The Athenians could pay for these food stocks using craft goods and money minted from productive silver mines operating in their territory. During the 5th century BC, a succession of Greek dynasts known as the Spartacids gained control over the small cluster of Hellenic cities occupying the Crimean Peninsula and the neighbouring Asiatic coast. The Spartacids became wealthy by shipping large volumes of grain to Athens, at a time when the city ruled a powerful maritime empire surrounding the Aegean Sea. In gratitude, the people of Athens granted honorary Athenian citizenship to their royal allies in Chersonensis. It was a 700-mile voyage from the Crimea to Athens, which represented a sailing of more than 10 days in optimum conditions. But the route was essential, and ancient sources confirm the scale of the Crimean grain trade that supplied Greek cities in the eastern Mediterranean. In 355 BC, the Athenian statesman Demosthenes explained, The Athenians have relied on imported grain more than any other nation. The grain we import from the Black Sea is equal to all the grain that comes to Athens from all other places. He confirms that Athens received over 16,000 tonnes of grain from the Chersonensis per annum, which would have been enough to feed about 30,000 people, a figure equivalent to the adult male citizen population. Imports on this scale suggest a merchant fleet of about 200 ships, each capable of transporting around 75 tonnes. In 340 BC, King Philip II of Macedon attacked the Greek merchant fleet leaving the Black Sea and captured 230 vessels, including 180 ships owned and crewed by Athenians. The manpower, prosperity and leisure time of the Athenian citizen class was therefore dependent on distant Black Sea trade routes. To learn more about this subject, please see part two of this lecture, Ancient Romans in the Black Sea. Subscribe to my channel and follow the link to my book, The Roman Empire and the Silk Roots.
Thank you.